When I looked at my corporate career, I realized 75% of the time was sat in a meeting room talking about nonsense. Welcome back to the Wild Goose Chase. Joining me today is Trevor G. Blake. Trevor is the author of a book called Three Simple Steps. He's also built companies worth over $1.3 billion. He's exited three of them for about $600 million. He's hired no employees and he works about four hours a day. Yes, you heard that right. And he's made, made he's been able to do all of that through the power of setting the right intentions and crafting his life consciously in a way that he desires. In this episode, we dig into how he does that in a way that you're going to be able to start to apply that in your own life as well. It's a fantastic episode. I can't wait to share it with you. But before we get into it, make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and share this with a friend, family member, or a loved one. And without any further ado, let's get stuck right into it. And I'll see you on the inside. Welcome back to the Wild Goose Chase. Joining me today is Trevor G. Blake. Trevor is a physicist, among other things, but also has exited three companies for over $600 million, never hired an employee, done all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff, author of the book, Three Simple Steps. Trevor, I'm excited to have you on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I look forward to a fireside chat. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. Before we get started, I actually want to share a story, if that's okay, I'm really grateful that you've uh, agreed to come on the show. A few years ago, I actually read Three Simple Steps. Now, most books, you know, the impact that's felt by an individual is about the right book at the right place at the right time for the right person. And I remember when I read Three Simple Steps, it is one of a few books that I have read more than five times. But the first time that I read it, I uh, remember vividly the impact that it was having on me. And I was living in Bondi Beach in Sydney and I I, I would walk around listening to this book and I specifically remember, I was listening to it on audiobook, and I specifically remember the moment that the book finished. I was halfway crossing a road and I had this instantaneous feeling like when you just lose someone that you love or when you lose a relationship. I had this moment when it finished where I had such sorrow. My heart sank and I, for a moment, I was like, I was bereft. I was like, oh my God, I, I can't believe that that is over and so for me it was a hugely impactful book and it's it's really helped to shape it was a very uh, important time of my life where I was facing a few challenges and that really helped to reshape my thinking on how to approach a lot and and a lot of this a lot of the stuff that you talk about in the book is really carried through so I just want to say thank you for that just to kick things off well I appreciate it I appreciate you saying that that usually people uh I moved to tears because of the terrible quality of the writing. So, <laughs> at least you, at least you moved to tears because there was something in it that uh, helped you. At the well, I didn't quite go to tears. I didn't quite go to tears, but I was, I was, I was like, I was like, oh my god, wow! And uh, I've recommended the book quite a lot to a lot of people. So, Trevor, before we kind of get stuck into it, there's a lot I really want to get into here. But why don't you give us just a quick? I don't want to do the whole backstory. People can actually go. This, they can go find that everywhere else, but. Can you give us the kind of quick synopsis? Like, who are you? What are you doing? And and give me a little bit of background on on how you've gotten to where you are now. Well, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. I always find that question difficult to answer. And in, in in America, uh, people are quite often uh, socially awkward. I don't know, I don't know if that's a general thing to say. If it's unfair to say it as a general statement, but and so when you get into a social situation, the first question you're always asked is, "So what do you do?" Because people like to talk <laughs> about their work, you know. And I, 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 you know, in England, you don't ask somebody what do you do because the unemployment level is usually pretty high, and most a lot of people you're talking to don't do anything because they, you know, they're unemployed. So it's not a question, but we we feel it's an implied question. So I always answered it in a kind of uh, facetious way, and I would always say, "Well, I read a lot," and they would say, "Oh, okay, I'll go and get a drink." And 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 you were left alone, which is the purpose of saying, "Like just leave me alone." Um, oh, but it's perfect. true. So I so so my my life story is one about reading a lot, and so you know, as a kid. I was English, but we moved, we got evicted from a house and we, we ended up in a farmhouse in Wales. And it was the time when the English were hated in Wales for oh, media, stu- stupid media sensationalism and stuff like that. And so I got bullied a lot and I, and you know, I was always fighting. I didn't win many because I'm only five foot eight, but, but I ended up, you know, in the end just saying, this is a waste of my life. And I would hide until the bullies got hungry and went home for their dinner. I would hide in the public library and I'd, I would go in the reference section and I thought, well, while I'm here, I may as well read. And that's where I learned to be a physicist, actually. So I read books on physics, quantum physics, which blew my mind. And I also read the biography section. And I read about these amazing people who were, you know, in, in these incredibly difficult circumstances had found a way to pull through and make amazing lives in all kinds of aspects of life, not, not necessarily business, but in adventuring and in all kinds of stuff. And then it, I started to see these patterns of behavior and these patterns of thinking. And I just did the same because I was 14 and I didn't know any difference. So I said, well, if it works for them, it'll work for me. And that's actually what became the book you were talking about, Three Simple Steps. It was these three simple, like flowing energies that they they exhibited on the world and it changed their lives. And so it completely changed my life. I went from being kind of a 
average student to being top student. I went from, you know, I, I went from being offered my, my school counselors, a career suggested that I should apply to be an apprentice manager at the local chicken packing factory. That's kind of how they saw me. <laughs> and I went from there to becoming an officer in the Royal Navy in less than 18 months. And it was simply because I picked up these behaviors and these ideas and I just carried them with me like a little backpack uh, my whole life. And and as you were saying about companies, I, I had a really good fast track career, you know, eating high on the hog and stuff. And then I decided to be my own boss uh, when I, I think I was 42 at the time. And uh, I thought I was too late, you know, like a late bloomer, but it turns out that was the ideal age. And so uh, I started my first company with a few hundred dollars and then I sold it for, as, as the book says, you know, for 105.5 million. And I realized it was all because of exhibiting these behaviors. So after... You know, the, I think a successful entrepreneur, you probably are the same. I think I've seen it on, on, your, on your website, Dash Dot. A successful entrepreneur, for me, is always someone that has a problem and they look for a solution because surely someone's fixed this by now, right? So someone's got to have solved it and all I have to do is give them a credit card and it'll be taken care of. And then you find out that no one's done it. So you say, sorry, I'm going to fix it myself. I yep. don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to go fix it myself. And so I've done that through my whole life with my own life, but also I've done it with my companies. And and so I have always had a little issue with the self-help and personal development genre in that so much of it is inauthentic. You know, the only success that a lot of people have in that business is that their book got onto Oprah Winfrey's you know, t- daytime TV show or something. They hadn't actually used anything in that book previously to prove that, that it works successfully. So I decided, okay, I can prove it now. I've used these three steps. I have built this company in an amazing way without ever without employing anybody and, you know, 76% net profits. I've got my day in the sunshine. I didn't, you know, obviously I had investors, so I didn't get all 105 million. So then I thought it was okay. I've qualified. I've got credibility. I'll write about it. And that's how that all came about. And so since then, I've just, I've just done a sort of rinse and repeat uh, with all my company. I'm, you know, I'm on company seven now. Just kind of written in a couple of books. Yeah, yeah. I've got three companies on the go at the same time right now. This is my global headquarters, which is right looking out over Laguna Beach. I love it. I want to dig into the companies. And I also know that you have some pretty unique work habits as well, which I want to dig into. But before before we kind of like move away from that, would you mind talking about what the three behaviors are or what the what the behaviors are that helped you to do that? Would you mind kind of like digging into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the first one, and this, this is, was the most startling thing in all those biographies, like, picked out is that these people suddenly at some point in their life at some age these amazing people had suddenly realized that their impressions of themselves were the ones that had been given to them by the world around them they had been impressed they had been you know in, impressed and impressionated by their religion their home life uh, the media the propaganda all of those kind of things and so the first part was kind of rebirthing yourself unraveling yourself like hang on a sec i'm not the apprentice manager of a chicken packing factory. I, I'm this guy, and I've got. I when I was when I was five years old, and someone said, "What do you want to be when you grew up?" I went, "I want to be a ninja," and I believed it, and I wanted that excitement back. And so, so the first part is about mentality control. It's about recovering the individual you you have the birthright to be, and it's simple, but it's not easy because it means it means changing a lot of the the habits of how we speak, the words we use, the, the imagination we have of ourselves, most of which is given to us by the world we allow ourselves to be impressed by. And so it's basically protecting yourself from those impressions and then so almost like uh, rebooting yourself, like reprogramming yourself. Mm. We have in the back of our necks here, we have a part of the brain and the brainstem called the reticular activation system. Only our cells and reptiles have that part of the brain or those kind of type of neurons. And, and it holds us in a loop. It does it out of kindness. It, it pay, it's like a Google algorithm. It pays attention to what we're paying attention to and gives us more of the same. So that's why you have people saying, you know, I've always had crap relationships, so I'm never got, I'm always in debt and all these kind of things. And it, it's because the reticular activation system thinks that's what you want because that's what you pay attention to. So what we do is we go through a process of, um, of reprogramming that. And so although it's easy to talk about and actually easy to do, it takes a bit of discipline to, to do it long enough for it to become a habit. So that's the first part. And then with this kind of new found power that we have, the second part is is to match the masculine and feminine energies of ourselves. And and those are terrible labels, but as, as scientists have pretty done, we're all dumb people at heart. We know one thing well. And so in order to try and explain it, we use dumb labels. And so the, these, these different types of energies, earth energies have been labeled masculine and feminine. And it's about getting the balance right. And so, in order, so, so then at that point, there's a lot of kind of, deepening intuition. You know, for me, I was brought up in a world where intuition wasn't valued. And yet I had amazing role models in my in my mother whose intuition was so incredibly strong, almost to the point of being psychic, but she wasn't psychic. She was just incredibly intuitive. And I wanted that. And that's been very useful to me as an entrepreneur. 
to be able to make decisions and have the confidence that I've made a good decision, but I've got no one else mm. to ask, no one else to, to, to make the decision for me. So, so it's birthing that. And so we go into some meditation techniques and, and connecting with, with nature. And then we take all of that power and we learn how to direct it to something we want for ourselves. Instead of being against something that's wrong in our lives, we put it towards something we really want. And that's called intention setting. It's, it's, I, I do a web free webinars called The Science of Intentions, which anyone can view. They're on my website, trevorgblake.com. And so, so that's just kind of the package. Uh, and when, and yeah. the, the thing about it is beauty is based on scientific principles, which I don't talk about in three simple steps, but I do in my transformation course, my experience. So these, mm. so the thing about that, it, because it's based on science, it takes the stress and pressure away of having to believe it, which I think is a bit of an issue with the way intentions is taught in many places. Be, you know, you have to kind of have faith in the teacher and that kind of, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? But when it's based on science. You don't even have to believe it. You just do it and things change. So th that's basically, that's it in a nutshell. I, I love that. And I think that's why it's, so I, I'm much like you. I think with this, the scientific approach to stuff, it has to, everything has to be able to withstand robust interrogation and stand up to robust logic, you know? And so I don't, you know, necessarily believe in just like having, I don't believe, believe in having blind faith. But what's interesting is if you can, actually understand the science behind some of this kind of stuff, then it becomes so real that it is believable and belief is the thing that actually matters the most. If you can, I have a, I have a saying that the universe will give you anything you want as fast as you want and in the volume that you desire, as long as you believe and are open to receiving. And so, but there's a belief part in there, which kind of goes into the first bit that you talked about, which was mentality control. And just to kind of like pull on that thread a little bit, what you're in effect saying is that your perception is your reality. So the words you use, the way you shape up, the, the, everything, the way that you see the world is the way that the world is. And in, in fact, you can take control back over that, then you can repurpose or redesign what your actual reality is. Is that a kind of a fair statement? Yeah, it's, it's spot on. It's uh, one of my, the favorite emails I get from the transformation experience are from people who become financially independent for the first time and, and how stress relieving that is. And they always, the emails always almost start exactly the same. Capital letters, wow, oh my God. I can't remember when I was last debt free. I probably was 10 years old. It's typically how the story comes back to me. And, and it all comes by mentality control. So, so it is, mm. most people are, you know, we, we we're kind of thrown into debt by the education system and society and mortgages and all of that, you know, and it gets, it weighs really heavy on us. I've been there, you know, I've, I was in hit, evicted three times. So I've seen what, what it did to my parents. I also almost got evicted myself when I first started out in life because I got a mortgage that I couldn't afford. And so I know how it feels for all that to go away. It just feels amazing. I, I was able to achieve it simply by changing the way I thought and spoke. And that was it. And I would play a little movie in my head of what it feels like to be financially independent, what it feels like to be able to afford anything and not think about mm. the price. And the little games that you play privately, you don't have to share this with anybody. In fact, you probably shouldn't. And, and so when I teach that to other people, they don't believe it, but I say it's scientific. It's based on energy. Energy works in this way. Time works in this way. We can use this to our advantage. Just do it. And those that have the discipline to just do it for a short period of time, it can be as less in, in less than a year, people become, you know, debt free for the first time. And, it, and then that's when I get those amazing emails where they say, wow, <laughs> and now I can live, you know? So, so that's, that's the way it works. It's just, it, it really is all simple, but we're taught the opposite. We're taught to value complication. We're taught to value mm -hmm. technology more, you know, whereas in, in reality, we create all that as well, just with mm -hmm. imagination. So, so it really is just a, a question of taking a little bit of discipline a little bit of time for yourself, laughing when you screw up, because I screw up all the time still. You know, I mean, mm. my, my wife will say, you, why are you saying that? You tell people not to say it that way. You know, we all screw up all the time. But what I found is if you are aware of that and you correct it four or five times a day, that's enough to get you the life of dreams. You don't have to become a saint. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. Six years ago, roughly, I was alcoholic, drug addict, broke, living on master's floor, like not the guy that I am now. And then literally through the process of actually continuously like reliving, like creating those future memories, creating that movie that you said, that you like continuously, and it's continuously for me, it's a continuously evolving process, but in a very short period of time, you know, complete transformation. And I think it, what it's really proven to me is that you really can actually, dis whatever you decide is going to be true. And so you can just kind of move your way in that direction. I want to talk about, I, I want to kind of come back to, how to um, how to get that vision right. I'm interested in talking about that. But first, the, the second piece you talked about was masculine and feminine. And um, I really love that because there's an old friend of mine taught me uh, a few years ago 
Because a lot of people, when they think about success, they think about things like money and they think about all these things, which typically have more of a masculine energy. And, you know, at the time I was in the process of moving from completely broke to not quite broke. (laughs) So for me, it was a lot like, right, I need to like, you know, I'm trying to like, I was fear driven, moving, trying. And a lot of the energy, my energy was very yang. And when, when I was in that state, I kept finding myself coming up against these kind of like roadblocks. And I was like, ah, it just was felt myself fighting. I was continuously fighting against the universe in a sense, energetically. And he said to me, the way to yang is through yin. The way to him is through her. And I was like, man, that is so good. And so that little saying has always reminded me because I have a tendency to kind of push into more masculine and then naturally come come up against, against kind of blockages And then whenever I come up against those blockages, and now it's become an instantaneous trigger, I'm like, ah, okay, yin, 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 because the way to him is through her, the way to to masculine is through feminine. What are your thoughts on that? Hey, we don't have enough time for this one, that's for sure. Uh, So (laughs) so you're you're spot on, but I I look at it from several different perspectives. So let me tell you the kind of human perspective. When I was a kid reading those biographies, one of them was Madam C.J. Walker, so so I'd never heard of her before. And so I was fascinated. So, here, so here she, she's a she's a black woman born to slaves in, a, in in America, sexually abused, and starving at age fourteen. Slavery is abolished, quote unquote, as they called it back then. But there were so many restrictions in the in in, in that world at that time. You were basically better off being a slave than not being a slave because the only jobs you could have were only men could work, and they could only have like a cultural jobs. As a black young woman, she wasn't allowed to own a knife and fork. Because they considered a weapon, wow. and it's, it was a, it was a society in a time of persecution and misery. She was so badly abused and so stressed out in life. She lost all her hair as a, as a young girl. She tried all kinds of tonics; nothing worked. It made it worse. So she developed her own tonic and started selling it door to door against the law. She became America's first female millionaire, and then wow. she used her success and her money in order to work on anti lynching laws. So she also had incredible impact. As a young man in a very male white society back in the 70s, that had a huge impression on me. And I wanted that. I wanted some of that. And I realized that I'm being brought up in a very macho masculine mentality where men rule. And yet here's this power. And I also was fortunate to be living, you know, in a house where my mother was given six months to live when I was seven. And I saw her one day look out through the back window in the kitchen, look up to the sky and say to God, I'll decide when I die, not you. And I'll die after my kids all grow up and they're safe. And she could be quite severe in my mum. And I, used to, I remember thinking, well, well, she scares me, but she also scares the hell out of God. So I just, what, what, what power? And I wanted some of that power. As I moved on in life, I found that when I was in, in an all-female division of a hospital where I worked, it was pretty, it was like feudal. It was, it was not pleasant mm. and things did not go well. When I moved to America and I worked for, for the big 3M, Fortune 100 company, it's the most macho male dominated company you could possibly imagine. Everyone went to strip clubs, played poker. In, in my first manager's meeting, there was one woman out of 50. So the complete opposites. Neither of them worked well. People could say, well, 3M's a success, but it was a success in, in its dominating day. It was just, they were horrible, toxic places to work. I learned that. And then I joined a company called Biogen and the, the leader of Biogen had our kind of approach. And so he made sure that all the teams were 50-50, 50 male, 50 female. And he made sure that everybody did what was typically a male job became a female job and vice versa and moved everybody around. And it was an absolute delight and we crushed it. We went from zero to a billion in sales in just over a year. I learned that. And so in my businesses, I don't have employees because I don't want to have to lose that time holding employees' hands. I like to focus on growth and marketing. But I have a HUD model. So all my vendors, I make sure... And this is probably politically incorrect, but I make sure to try and find the vendor I'm looking for that's led by a female entrepreneur, mm. female CEO if possible. And it works beautifully. And the reason I've gone for that is that I'm also fascinated by energy itself. And so I'm understanding how energy itself doesn't exist. It's, it's an ob- ob- we observe change. Everything's constantly changing. We observe change. We in our three-dimensional five sensory limitations. We have to give it labels. So we say, you know, that's male energy, that's female energy. And then we draw it out graphically to try and understand it. And so what we say is male energy is typically linear and slow. It's like a clipboard mentality, build a railroad, build a, build a straight road, build a rocket to the moon. Very, very, it's very linear and very slow. Have a problem, call a meeting. Want to build a company, make it hierarchical. That's kind of the male or the masculine energy 
that has dominated for so long. What we're in right now is a switch because energy moves in waves. And so we're at another part of the wave. And in this switch, we're going to what we would label feminine energy, which is spinning and fast. It's, it's giddy. It's exhausting. And you have to get in it or you get left behind. Well, one of the things about, the, one of the beautiful things about feminine energy, I think I talked about this in Three Simple Steps actually, is that in history, in you know the, the great female warriors, they were ruthless, far more ruthless than men. They did not take prisoners and they did not go back to help their wounded. They were protecting their troop, their group, their tribe, their, their nation, and they're not going to give away food to prisoners and they're not going to waste time trying to take care of those that c- couldn't fight for themselves. And so, so in business, I see this all the time. All the masculine energy companies, you know, like the, the big companies here, like uh, Circus City, Sears, and all that kind of stuff, blockbusters, they're gone. They're boarded mm. up. And everything's gone to smaller, faster spinning companies with, with really a small number of really peer to peer workers or employees or contractors. But instead of it being supervisory and a straight line, now it's spinning and everybody's equal mm-hmm. and everybody's opinion is valuable. So I've, I've seen that happen in the, I observe that happening in the world. And my advice to people is to get on board and get left behind. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. kind of what I do with my transformation experience. Get people to understand that there isn't a division. We're all both, we, we can tap into all of this, this energy, but there's times when one is more valuable than the other one. And that's when people like me being primarily male from my stones, that's when I need to really work on my intuition. That's when I really need to work on being able to adapt quickly and, and, and spin. You know, every woman I've ever been inspired by, I was, I was married for 40 years to an incredible woman who unfortunately died in 2020. And I, I remarried uh, recently to another really inspiring woman who's incredibly well-known and famous in the world of art. Their success and their, they, they were able to spin really quickly and change and adapt and move quickly. Whereas all the men in my life, kind of get left behind and get miserable and bitter and all you know, as time goes by. So I've been aware of that and I've been able to sort of dance mm. between one energy and the other. And it's so much fun. Um, how do you do that then? How do you do that then? Yeah, but, but that's kind of how it is. How do you do that then? Like how do you, how do you actually start to, aside from associating with more women, like you say you, you, know, you, you seek out commercial partners that are driven by female CEOs and entrepreneurs, but how do you as a primarily you know, male human being, like how do you bring that into your own life? How do you start to spin? I've had to reinvent myself because I've had to, so I've had to change my mentality from the corporate world, which was very much supervisory. Someone has an idea, I filter it so it's suitable to pass up the chain and and that's, that has to go. That's just, there's no time for that anymore. Uh, someone has a problem, there's no time to call a meeting anymore. A decision has to be made on the spot now. You can't, you can't get a group together and wait for consensus. So I've learned to adapt my entrepreneurial mindset first and foremost, so that I can trust my own intuition and make decisions quickly. But I've also structured my companies in a way that works and dances with the spinning, the rotation of a, of, of a feminine energy. So I use a hub model and there's, there were two reasons for me doing that. One was to match the energy because I knew we were going to have to move quickly. You have to get big fast today. It's, it, you can't, it, the, old, the old days was, you know, kind of make a success in, in your neighborhood then go to the town, then go to the city, then maybe the region. And then only if you were really amazing over a period of 50 years, you know, you'd probably go national. The average age of, a, of the average life age of a company, even up to 15 years ago, was 75 years of, of the Fortune 500. Now it's 15 and soon mm. only five years. If you don't make it quickly, you don't make it at all anymore. And so you need to, to structure in a way that you can spin. So I prefer to hire vendors and then I have to change my supervisory mentality to peer to peer. So I've had to learn over the years, know my companies, to sit on my hands a lot because the tendency previously would be, you know, these, these vendors know what they're doing. They don't need me. They don't need my advice. I'm a pain in the neck to them. And my tendency in the beginning was to pick the phone up and say, how's it going? I haven't heard from you in a week, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That has to all go where I trust them. They get the job done. I don't care whether it takes them a day or a year. I pay them for the result. And what I end up also doing is taking that sort of feminine mentality of, you know, everyone sharing in the feast. So I do a lot of profit share on top of my fee for services with these people. So they, they feel a great ownership. I'm very careful also as a, as, a, as a good mother would do with the kids to always tell them the good news stories, not the bad news stories. I always make sure that everyone who's involved in my business, no matter how small their part might be, it might be just one hour a week, I make sure that they hear all the good news stories. And I thank them that you're one of the people that makes that happen. Because without you, it wouldn't happen. And then they get this beautiful launcher. So it feels more like a family than a company. Once you start to change, once I start to change my attitude and structure it in a separate way, 
And so that that makes it so much fun that it doesn't feel like work for anyone, any of us. You know, no one's going to admit that they would do it for free, but yeah, we do it for free. Yeah, I mean, I'm super proud of the culture that we've built at Dashdot. Obviously, we've got we've got two companies now. We've got Dashdot and we've got Global Prop Tech Solutions, which is our real estate technology company. But Dashdot, actually, we just received news that we're in the top 10 best places to work in Australia, which is pretty pretty That's awesome. Sweet. And yeah, yeah it's but- so cool because, you know, our, yeah, our vision for creating a company was to create a place that everyone would be inspired to work and that they wouldn't feel like they need to take a break from. You know, we have, there's a lot of things that we do. People have got unlimited paid annual leave. They can work from anywhere. And, and But really it's about how you interact with each other and we also give ownership. You know, we have ESOPs, people have got equity, like that for all of the kind of stuff that you said because you want everyone to have a be part of a shared vision. I am interested to, you've got a different model though. We've got a team of employees, right? Which is totally cool and I love it and it's such an amazing team. But your the way that you've grown your businesses and I'd like to kind of, move into this a little bit now the way you've grown your businesses as you mentioned is a hub model where basically you don't hire any employees you find vendors to do specialized parts of the process you effectively and don't let me put words in your mouth but i'm trying to understand this but you effectively architect okay this is what we're doing this is where we're going this is what the journey is going to look like these are the key players that i need in that journey and then you find the right people to sit in those seats is that a fair kind of statement because i've got follow-up questions on that is that a fair kind of yeah, assessment? It, it is, and, the, and there's uh, probably the, a little more to it as well. I, I was I was influenced by my corporate career, and and I when I looked at my corporate career, I realized 75% of the time was sat in a meeting room talking about nonsense. It wasn't about mm. the customer experience. It wasn't about upgrading a product or anything like that. It was all about how to keep employees happy. I spent mm. a day and a half in a meeting deciding with the senior executive team whether the employees should be allowed to take yesterday as a snow day or had to be vacation. I mean, that is madness, but it's corporate madness and it's, 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 it's everywhere. It's mad. Everyone's had those experiences if they've worked in any kind of corporate world that you get those experiences. So I didn't want that. I didn't think that would be any fun. And so I wanted to focus on the customer experience primarily and producing amazing product. And so the reason I had the confidence to do that was that in the last company I was with before I left us to start my own thing, I made the point of making an absolute nuisance of myself by going from function to function to function to function with a box of pizza and saying, can I sit down with you for an hour? I want to learn what you do in distribution. I don't know anything about it. I'm a sales and marketing guy. What, what, what are your issues in distribution? How do you, why, why do we never hear from you in sales and marketing? What's your opinions? All that kind of stuff. And they actually quite enjoyed talking about themselves and, and, and having a pizza. And, I, and then I got to get build these friendships. And I did it all through every function. This was advice I was given and by, by uh, the guy who built Amgen and Icos, uh, George Rothman. That's what he did when he first started. He was a pharmacist, didn't know anything about business. And he built a $60 billion company. And he said, that's what I did. I went around like, to try and learn off other people because we have these mirror neurons in the front, going back to the science that allow us to copy without experiencing. So when we see a child put their hand on a stove, we know that stove is hot. Whereas if I was a sheep, I wouldn't know that. And one sheep would burn itself, the next one burns itself, the next one burns itself, because they don't have these mirror neurons. And so what I did was use these and say, okay, if I can watch this for a while, I can learn all the issues. And and when I start my own company, I'll be a little bit smarter. What I found was when I started my first company, I had the confidence to manage all those functions. I didn't, so the tendency for most entrepreneurs is to immediately hire a, you know, a leader of sales marketing, a leader of finance, a leader of this, a leader of that, because they don't have the confidence in themselves to know those functions. So by doing that, I gave myself the confidence to say, okay, at least when I start for a period of time, I'll do it all myself. And then when some money comes in, I'll start hiring. Well, the money came in and I realized I didn't need to hire. I was able to spot a good vendor and I had the common sense enough to know that it's not about the best price. It's about the best partner. So, so even though even though this one's ten and this one's five, if the ten's better, go with the ten. When I get bigger, I'll have the power to negotiate. But right now, I just want the best. So I hired mm. really good vendors, and I'm still with most of them. They've been through all my companies, and um, you know we've grown up together. You know everyone's got families now. But so that's really how it was. It was it was having the. I think it was being humble enough and having the common sense to roll up your sleeves and start talking to people you were. I, I started to, to think of the last two years as an, as an employed individual, I started to think of my company as paid training. And that way I was able to keep going a bit longer because it was a miserable place to work. But I was able to keep to go longer and battle less knowing that I'm absorbing all this information and all this knowledge and then I'll be a much better entrepreneur as a result. That's kind of how my thought process was. Nice, nice. Okay, that's 
Good. That's really good insights. I've got so many questions about all of this. <laughs> you said you mentioned about getting big fast. Now, before we kind of go into that, as I understand it, all of your companies have been in uh, the science sector. Is that is that fair or is that accurate? Or can you uh, talk to me a little bit about that? And then I'm interested to know how to get four, big fast. Four of them. Four of them have been in, in different types of healthcare. So I've had revenue generating companies and development companies. I'm negotiating Got it. a deal for my for my last development company now or in the process of. And then, you know, this is the digital space, TrevorGBlake.com, which I've, I only started two years ago. And, and that is definitely a world to get big fast. And I have an animal sanctuary and I have a, a movie production company. So they're all quite different. I mean, you could say that, you know, I started off in one space and gained confidence. I think that's true to say, that's fair to say, you know, go branching out into other areas, but they're all hub models, all of them. And uh, yeah. it's just, it's just really plug and play, to be honest with you. Okay. So how do you get big fast? What was your, what's your advice to me? So I've got, we've got our, um, we've got two businesses, as I mentioned, one of them is primarily a service-based business. Love it. It's an amazing, amazing company, but it, we've got a lot of, a lot of team. And then the other one is more of a science-based technology play. What advice would you give to me if we, if I wanted to grow fast, real fast? How would you think about that? Or what advice would you give? So it's done with your imagination. There's no technology involved. And so when I started my first company, I, I I didn't even have a name for it. And I set my intention to sell it for at least $100 million. I didn't tell anybody because they would think I was crazy. The reason I chose that was because I had a big row with my boss and he actually looked me in the face and said, you're not good enough to be an entrepreneur, Trevor. You don't have the skills. You don't have finance background. You're junior management, not senior management, which wasn't true. I was both quote unquote senior management. And, and it really pissed me off, to be honest with you. So I, I was determined to prove him wrong. And the way to prove him wrong was we were in the, in that business. It was in the pharma business. And I could, I had a niche I was going after, which is very important. And what would deem, what would be deemed success in that niche was a hundred million. So I aimed to sell a company for a hundred million right from the very beginning. I had no idea how to do it, but I imagined that day. And I never stopped imagining it, no matter what was happening in the company, no matter the days when things don't go so well and the days when things go brilliantly, I never stopped imagining that. That day when I sell it and he gets to see the press release, so I'm going to make sure he sees it. As it turned out, I didn't have to show it to him. Somebody who was working for me used to work for him and was in a, in a meeting at the dinner table when he saw the, in those days it was a pager, when he saw the page checks text come through and he handed it across the table to him. And the guy, we're still sort of friends or acquaintances. The guy's name is John. I'll give, I'll give his last name away. But his, his, the blood drained from his face. And, and uh, that was my moment. And so I've done that with all the companies. So I will set a target in my head and imagine it as already achieved. And that's one of the secrets of intentions. The science of intentions is a free webinar I do. There's loads of copies on the trevorgblake.com. And it's in the transformation experience if you really want to get into the you know nitty gritty of it. But what are the, so, so it has these rules, science of intentions, has what I call the five P's, these rules. And, and, but it also crushes time. And so one of the really clever tricks is to imagine something is already achieved. And so that's how it's done. It, after that how, point, how do you, do, how, how do you do that though? Like, like, because I, so there's a big difference between setting a goal, right? Hmm? I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a $1 billion company in five years time. Great. We well, won't that's get nice. it because of the way you just said it, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's dig into that. Let's get, let's dig into that. So, so, so I am going to means you'll be, always have a life of frustration because it's always going to be in front of you. Mm. You probably won't even get close. So what do you have to do? This is, I mean, this goes back to mentality control, how we use our words. So, so what you have to change is for, you have to start to imagine it already has happened and we crush time. Time's an illusion. It's a beautiful illusion mm. that we need to get through a three dimensional experience, but it, but it is an illusion. And so when you imagine something is already achieved, you start to change the way you talk. So you start mm. to say things like, so, so my, my, my intention for the first company wasn't, I will sell this company for a hundred million. It was, I have sold all medical for at least a hundred million dollars. Cause I didn't want to limit myself. I just sold for 105.5, I think five and a half, six years later. So, and that was the slowest and, and slowest beginning to sale company that I've had. The next company, two years, 300 million. And your confidence level goes up, right? So, so, uh, and the negotiation I'm doing now, it's a $500 million deal. And so, so, but in my mind, I, I'm, I'm really stealing from, from Neville Goddard. Okay. This is a self-help guru from the forties where he said, the feeling is the most important thing. And so if you can start to feel what it feels like to have already achieved that, you start to think it's already achieved. It's like a Walter Mitty thing. And then when it happens, you're kind of not surprised. And so, so what I do is I set, and this is what I call, it's a technique in the transformation experience I call mini mind movie. So I set this technique. 
of what happens the day after. And so typically when you have this day in the sunshine and you, and you look at your bank statement and even I get excited, right? Even today, like, oh, I can't believe it. Look at that, print it out, you know? And, uh, and, and so you imagine what you do next. And I always do something for everybody who's helped me get there. It could be something spectacular. We get in a private jet, we go and spend a week in Necker Island. doesn't matter what it is, but I imagine that it's already achieved. And during the journey, I will go visit Necker Island. I will have some private jet moments. And so, and so I, when I, when it happens, it's not a surprise. What you're doing is saying, I want to, I can, and I will, which is a way we're all mm. taught in goal setting techniques. And it doesn't work because it's not so true. So tra- transparently, the way that I actually write my goals, but I'm really glad to be right there is, is in the, uh, in the present tense. You know, I have, I have all that kind yeah. of stuff. I am, I have. So I, I love that we went there. However, I want to actually kind of, dig into something a little bit. The way that I the way that I do it, right, is I have, I, me and my partner, Gabby, we built out a 25-year uh, life plan and we basically go, in 25 years, what does our life look like? And then it's all present tense, right? We have, we are, we at, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then we do 25, 10, 5, uh, 1, 90 days. Now, that is good because that allows you to have a con- like a long time continuum and you can s- mentally live out your life unfolding at it and it's i found it to be really useful because you know you do go into that place particularly when you use a language of like i have and i am it really changes the way that your brain works is it more effective do you think and this can just be an opinion do you think it's more effective though to have a specific like big target right which could be um which could be let's say a billion dollar company or something like that versus all of these features of what your whole life is going to look like? Do you think it's actually better to crystallize the intention so you almost magnify it around a single focus point? Or do you have any kind of thoughts on that? I'm basically, I'm trying to optimize my way to success and I'm trying to leverage the best information out of you. So all help is uh, appreciated. That's good because that's all I've ever done. I've just relocated this this amazing information from all those amazing biographies there. So we're, we're, we're good relocators of information. That's all we are. And so the way I do it and the way I teach it is that you set a mini mind movie and it's, and the movie is kind of a day in the life of. And so, so this movie, like all good movies, encompasses location, weather, lifestyle, relationship. If you want business, all the toys, all of that is in your little sort of, you know, Goose McGrath commercial that's in your head, right? And you play that on a loop. As you especially play it when you get knockbacks, as we all do, because nothing goes in a straight line. So, so or, or when someone really gets into your skin or something, you, you just keep playing that movie all the time. And it's the movie of what my life looks like in this dream. And, and yes, it's absolutely huge. There is no relationship between goals and intentions. We need goals. I set budgets and forecasts just like you do. I, I set milestones just like you do. But intentions are huge. Intentions are your biggest dream. It's so big, you probably don't even dare to share it with your wife. And so you play that mini mind movie in your head and, and you play it all the time, but it's a lifestyle movie. And then what we do is we go through a process while, while we keep playing that, we go through a process of window shopping it. So let's say someone's mini mind movie that right now they're in an apartment downtown somewhere, but what they really want is to live in a $5 million uh, beachfront home. You start to window. So you, you imagine what that feels like. You imagine the smell of the salt in the air. You imagine the breeze on your face and the the feel of the sand under your feet. You have to get all of your senses involved. And then you go window shop that. So you go and look at some open houses on the beach. You go walk on the most beautiful sand. You know, you do all of the things that will one day be your lifestyle. So, and that enhances the movie. It kind of goes from sepia to a little more black and white to a little bit of color to beautiful 4K or something, you know, the more window shopping that we do. It's a, it's a process. It doesn't take long and it's so much fun. And it's, it, it, I won't say it's effortless because you have to get into the habit of doing it. But, you know, at first, sometimes people are a little intimidated, you know, going to an open house or, you know, going to a private jet uh, terminal, something like that, you know, just to see what the waiting room's like. And then you get the confidence because you realize that these people are pretty much bored out of their minds and they can't wait to show you, you know, they can't wait to take you a test drive in the supercar. They can't wait to show you this beautiful house that they're representing and couldn't afford themselves. You, eventually over time, you, you get a little bit more cocky in the window shopping area of this. And then the mini mind movie explodes and then everything just shows up. And there's a scientific reason for all of this. And we have to, you'd have to get into quantum physics for it. So there's three principles of quantum physics in the transformation experience. This one relates to string theory. And string Perfect. Theory tells- I love it. Let's go there. Okay. Okay. So string theory tells us that in order for anything to exist, it has to exist 
in multiple dimensions, of which there are at least 10 that are confirmed, 28 probably, and maybe one day we'll find out there's 100. What are they? We have no way of knowing because we're three-dimensional, unless you work on your senses. If you work on stretching your senses, then you can, do, or you, you're really good at meditation, or you can astral travel, those, you can get a snippet of what another dimension might feel like. But your imagination is like a golden key to them all. And so if you can use your imagination, if you can put yourself in a place where you're more open to other to other experiences in three dimensions and you use your imagination well, then you can create in a space using string theory because it happens instantaneously there. And because for anything to exist, it has to also exist in all of the dimensions at the same time, it will show up in a three-dimensional world. And so it sounds a little new age, it sounds a bit woo-woo, but it's actually a scientific principle that I've proved over and over, and I get all these emails from people. Uh, I'll give you a good example. So one guy joined Transformation Experience, he's up to his eyes in debt, he's in the corporate world, he's desperate to get out, but he doesn't have the courage. Few conversations, he he jumps. I finally get him to jump off the cliff. We don't really have a lot of communication after that because he's doing the program, he's 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 doing his quiet time, he's he's getting into nature, he's setting his intentions, he's building his mini mind, he's doing his window shopping. And then every now and again, he'll check in. He's one of the guys that first said, I'm dead free, I can't believe it. And uh, anyway, today, he's totally free, totally financially independent. He always wanted to live in Norway. He's living in Norway, doing the, with a company that has, is his hobby as much as it is uh, his work. And he's just signed a $250 million deal. All of that was done with imagination. And you know, he's not the only one. He's just the latest one that I was, I was talking to. But So all of this is done with incredible imagination just learning to use it. But most people have forgotten how to use them at an ending. We knew when so, we were Yeah, yeah. So how, how, how do you – talk to me about the intersection between action and imagination though because uh, I suspect that you can't just imagine it. You could have the best mind movie in the world, but if you don't also simultaneously take action – towards your goals, then you're probably not going to get any. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to be challenged on this, by the way, if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> but but no, actually, um, I'm glad you brought it, seems it, to me that it's, it up. Because now I'm telling yeah, with you because I've, I really am um, kind of an anti-law of attraction person. I find that so that mm. concept so annoying. And based on- It's more like a law of action. Nothing. No, even the people involved in that, there was just really brilliant marketing, but the people involved in it, yeah, yeah. you know, a $300 million lawsuit for, for 15 or 20 years, they're not law of action or law of attraction, I say, not law of attraction people. So, so the, so the clue is, yes, you will get it with you. So you just use your imagination, just use the power of intention. But what will happen is you'll find that life, you, so, so we're all connected through a thing called the Higgs field. They call it the cosmic glue. And what happens is every time you do that, you kind of send out some kind of signal like a lighthouse. And it gets noticed and you draw to yourself events, people, things that seem like miracles that just show up. I've got lots of anecdotes and stories, even in three simple steps. I talk about the phone just going on my desk, changed my life. And, I, and he and I are still friends and we still don't know how he got to know it. He can't remember where he got my number from. I'd never met him, but I'd never heard of him before. That changed everything for me with the first company. So, so what happens is life starts to throw little clues at you. So you'll be, you know, lining up for your coffee in your favorite coffee shop and you're suddenly feeling the pit of your stomach and urge to start talking to a complete stranger, which you wouldn't normally do because it's not your character. And that person turns around and turns out to be the perfect link to the next part of the puzzle, the perfect piece of the jigsaw. And that's the, so what you, so what you do, you have to take action, but you become what I call the stance of the wizard. So, so what you do is the stance of the wizard is to step back, observe, assess, and then react in, the, in a beneficial way. And so what you, tend to, what, you, what you do once you set your intention, once you've got your mini mind movie, is you go out into the world with eyes wide open. And it's things that you would have missed before, people you suddenly bump into that you would have walked past before, everything becomes part of this magical play of energy. And so you just respond to that and keep moving forward. I call it reacting forward. It all happens effortlessly, but some people... If they've read something like Law of Attraction, they'll think that the secret is to have a great idea and then sit in a chair and wait for it to come through the front door. I've not experienced it that way, so I don't believe that's possible and it's not scientific. But the science mm. backs up because thoughts are energy too. They have a measurable electric charge. Sending thoughts brings the result of that thought. That's energy. Energy goes by the laws of thermodynamics. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only converted into another form. This is a law of the universe. It's irrefutable. And so if our thoughts are energy, they have two choices. One is they stay out there as a thought, which is a scary thought, but I think about all the thoughts I've had over my life, or it converts to something 
And I believe that's the process that happens and that becomes the life that we live. So or the life we have today, we have to take responsibility for. We have to say, I created this maybe inadvertently or unknowingly because of my thoughts and my words and my actions. Now I'm going to recreate it. I'm going to have this great imagination. I'm going to be for something I want. I'm going to put that out there. And then I'm going to respond and react to everything that happens in a different way. Mm. And everything. Love that. I love that. So you've obviously developed an ability, and I say develop, developed the ability to think bigger. And you mentioned your first company, you set the intention that you were going to sell it for at least 100 million, you sold it for 105. Yeah, I think you mentioned the second one was you sold it for like 300 million. And so, and that was faster. And it seems like what's happening in your life is you're going bigger and faster all the time. Is that a is that kind of like a fair assessment? And I'm interested to know if you could kind of go backward, if that is true, how, if you could go backwards even to yourself, how would you get yourself to think bigger earlier? I, I picked it out of those biographies because they all aimed so high and crazily. I thought I could do the same thing. Now, at the time, you know, I'm poor. Uh, my father's uh, unemployed and unemployable. My mother, obviously, is, you know, she's she's dying. As so, so you know, there's, there, we're on welfare, thanks, thanks to, to the society and to welfare. And yet I had the dream, the intention of becoming a naval officer. No one from that area, from that background, from, you know, lower class uh, society as it was back then, would ever make the jump from apprentice manager to chicken packing factory to becoming a Royal Naval officer. And yet I made it happen just by imagining it. And I imagined it all. I even went down to the college and touched the walls and looked through the gates and all that kind of stuff. And then 18 months later, I was there. And I did really well. I had a really good Navy, Navy career, which was blown up by meeting my wife. I had the same thing. I was, I was quite lonely as a kid. No confidence with girls whatsoever, but I imagined this amazing relationship that would inspire me. And then I met Lynn and we were together 40 years and it inspired me in amazing ways. So it's all, it's all done that way. But what I know now is that if I went back in time, the only difference between aiming at that or aiming at a hundred million or aiming at a billion was my imagination. It took no more energy for any of it. So the energy- Wait, wait there's a belief piece in there, right? Because you, be you need to be able to believe it as well in order for you to be able to get to that place in your mind where you can set the right intention and be in that place in the future as, as it being real, there's a belief piece. Is that- I think when I, first, I think, yeah, before I was a physicist, it was pure belief that I can do this and I'm going to do it. So that's gone. That's what got me to the Navy. After that, I've proved it and I know it's real. Right? So it wasn't chance. It wasn't luck because they, they take no prisoners in the Royal Navy. They throw you out. If you miss one little thing, you're gone. 120 people joined and, I, and only five of us graduated. So that was a big confidence booster. After that, I know it works. Then I became the physicist still you know, through the, partly the naval training and finished off in, in the College of London College. Uh, and then I understand why and how that worked. And that took the need to believe it away completely. And I know that if I'd known that first, I might have aimed even higher. And so, so when it came to doing my own thing, my own companies and stuff like that, belief isn't required because it's a, it's a scientific process I go through. And so mm. I, every company I've started, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing and I'm totally unqualified. It doesn't matter. I don't need to believe it. I know what the end result's going to be because I put into play these tools and techniques that I share in, in the transformation experience in particular. Mm. All you have to do is play with those tools and you'll create any outcome that you want. It's remarkably simple, but it's too simple sometimes and people think it's too good to be true. But all you, so you don't need the belief. Mm, I love that. We'll definitely be putting a, a link to the, to the, to the course and, and to we'll start in there. Show notes. So I think a lot of people benefit from it. Can you talk to me about, um, I know we're limited on time. There's a couple of things I want to touch on. Number one, how many hours, of, hours a day do you work? Number two, I believe that the um, the company that you're negotiating the sale of at the moment, and I might have butchered that a little bit, is actually tied back to your mother. And I'd like to kind of like touch on those two things before we before we uh, run out of time today. So, what do you want to say? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm basically lazy. I, I, I you know I have my priority. My priorities are, are you know my wife, my dogs, my garden, walking on the beach, playing soccer, playing tennis. Oh, and yeah, I got I got to earn a living, and and so. I've never been one to, who really wanted to work long hours. And so I was delighted when, you know, back in the eighties, all this, um, neuroanatomy and, 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 all, you know, all those new information about how the mind works came out and I thirsted for it and digested it. And so I found a, I found a way to, to achieve peak performance and I learned amazing things. What, first of all, it's impossible for the mind to, to concentrate and focus for more than two hours. In most cases, the scientists say 20 minutes or so, 
So we get diminishing returns and we fool ourselves into thinking we're in a zone where actually what we're doing is shutting down one cell at a time. So I thought that's very useful, and very interesting. So I'll split my day up into sections. And then the second thing I learned was the brain's at its most creative when it's actually tired. So that helped me with my writing career. So I decided, okay, I'll only write in the evening. And then, then we learned from great leaders, you know, like NASA, for instance, that there's tremendous value in napping, relaxing, taking time out in nature. And they insist that their pilots do that. Their performance goes up to 64% after that. And so I thought that was a, a, a fantastic information. So I was like, I'm going to put this together in my lifestyle because one of the challenges of being a solo proprietor or a solo entrepreneur is you can get burned out really quickly because you, you're mm-hmm. sat there waiting for the computers to bing and you sat there waiting for the phone to go. And if it doesn't, you think you're doing something wrong, right? And that's the problem mm-hmm. I had with my hub model is that they just take care of everything. And I actually went on vacation to London for three weeks couldn't communicate because I had an old cell phone at the time and, and couldn't figure it out. When I got back, I thought all oh, hell must have broken loose and I'll have all of these emails and all of these phone calls. They hadn't even noticed I'd gone. They were so self-reliant in the hub model. So I learned I'm going to have to work in a different way. So I, I adopted this thing and I, there's actually a free download on trevorgblake.com called The Practical Magic of the Five-Hour Workday. It's not as alien or as new age as it might sound because if we go back in time, people only work four hours a day. In the modern workplace, people have been, you know, tested and surveyed and watched, and they only are th- only on efficient in the workplace for two hours and fifty three minutes a day. So it actually it starts to make scientific sense. And so what I found was if I split my day up and I work between nine, so nothing in the morning, no devices, they're all off. So I don't, I'm, my, I'm dedicated to my life, and my family, and my animals. So, uh, so at nine o'clock I'll start work and I'll finish exactly eleven. I don't care what's going on. I'm stopping at eleven. End of. And then I'll go and walk in nature for a couple of hours. And now I'll have lunch with, with Jess and we could last two hours. We'll have a couple of glasses of wine. And then I'll work between two and four or three and five, depending on how I'm feeling. And that's it. And I've found that those productive periods are really, really good. I'm, I'm, it's like I've got a workforce of 100 people around me. My mind's popping all kinds of stuff out. But what I found was the most important was the, pl- the parts in between. So, so when I stopped myself at 11 and went and walked with the dogs in the woods and just sat under a tree, I had all these amazing aha moments that I'd just been trying to solve at a computer. And so why didn't I think of that before? It's so obvious. And so I realized there was a real magic into, into building relaxation periods into my day. So it's fair to say that I work the same 10 hour work day as anybody else, but my work is often sitting under a tree, hmm. swimming in my pool, walking on the beach. I consider that just as important as cracking a problem at the computer. So that's the five hour part of it. Super interesting. Yeah, super interesting. And you, you mentioned there about the, like almost like the guilt, I guess, or the, the trouble with entrepreneurs. <laughs> like unless there's things pinging at you and like unless you're like constantly attacking something, then you're failing. And it's a very, it's a very, that you, you know, I was a little bit triggered when you said that because I was like, oh my God, that's, that's uh, definitely me. Because <laughs> I just, I want to attack things all the time. And you know, I feel like if I'm not, attacking something then everything's failing and i'm failing and everything's everything's going to blow up and i'm going to die you know it's a genuine fear it is and i i find the opposite to be true in, in the if you let alone sit on your hand just put things mm. so i had a situation yesterday a crisis with a company I'm, I'm negotiating with and i was at lunch so i'm not gonna i, I wasn't even gonna answer it by the time i got back from lunch they'd solved it themselves if i mm. hadn't have been absent that had been, you know, if, if I'd been in an office, that had been in my office and in my, and we'd have, we'd have gone down a rabbit hole that didn't need to go down. So I find that happens mm. a lot. Things resolve themselves. The guilt thing's really important. I, I know people, I have friends who work 14 hour days, but they're on the third marriage. The dogs mm. don't even know who they are. And that's not a lifestyle I want. I want success with balance. And so, so for me, if anyone's feeling like that, feeling they're working too well, or the, you know, they're having relationship problems because they're always on, they're always at work, the phone's always going at night and stuff like that. All the, all the answers to that are, are available at trevorgblake.com in that five hour. It's a freebie. I wrote it uh, for COVID because so many people were moving out of the corporate office when they, they knew the system and felt safe and working from home with no training and no advice. And they, a lot of them got burned out for exactly mm. the same reason you're saying. They feel like I've got to be on it all the time. And they haven't realized that actually that's not how it works. That's not how the brain works. It's not peak brain performance. And so there's a different way of doing things and getting better results. And it doesn't work for everybody because everyone's got, you know, different, you could be in the healthcare field where you can't say no to patients and things like that. Uh, yeah. But, but in, in- Someone's like, having a heart attack and you're like, sorry, I'm, I've got, it's my pool time. Yeah, I'm sitting in the tree, <laughs> sorry, I'll be there in two hours. 
thing. No, I think yeah, that's totally. the British healthcare system. I think that's how it that works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Okay, cool. I love that, and there's definitely a lot of lessons there to learn. Talk to me about your talk to me about your current company because I know that in the in the book Three Simple Steps, you know, a big part of the a big part of the book was the was the story about your mother and also your life, and it was beautifully told. And one of the things was that, and actually, why don't you, why don't you kind of, why don't you kind of let us, let us in on it? What's the? Yeah, it really, I mean, it, yeah. it was just something that inspired me as a kid, and 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 also devastated me because my mum, like 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 most cancer patients, showed incredible grace with the fact that she'd been given, you know, six months to live and and was and you know, was expected to die. And she, I wouldn't say that she fought it. I'd say that she just was determined. Indefatigable was a good word. She was indefatigable. I'm not going yet. And, and she, you know, she lived until I was uh, 20. So that's amazing when you think about it in those days. Mm. But, but she had all of these uh, treatments and the side effects just destroyed her womanhood and, and, and tried to steal her spirit. That's where the fight was. It, the fight wasn't with the cancer. The fight was with the cancer treatment. That always made an impression. And I always had in the back of my mind one day that if I find technology or when I find technology that can strip away the side effects and also treat the cancer that I'm in, I'm going in on that. And, and ironically, it was uh, while I was building my first company, um, I was in an office space uh, with, a, with a company next door. They ran out of money, but they'd ha- they had this beautiful uh, portfolio of potential cancer treatments, and I got to see the data close up. So I started the company around it, even though I didn't know what I was doing, put a team together, and it looked too good to be true. It looked to be very powerful treatment for some very difficult drug-resistant cancers, and it didn't have any side effects. And, and I would talk about it and investors and other people would laugh at me and say, that's not possible. You know, I'm going to save you from yourself, Trevor. Don't put money in this. You're going to lose all your money, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm. And so I dribbled my money from my other companies for a number of years. So that, that, I started that in 2005. And so I'm negotiating the style of it now. We just finished our first phase one trial. And, you know, we're showing effect in tumors that have been treated by six different classes of cancer drug and nothing's worked. And we've shrunk the tumor by half. But the most important thing is not a single additional side of it. Wow. And that's a beautiful thing. I can't claim any credit for it except that I've put the company together and I've been funding it. Exactly what we were talking about. I imagined it's success and brilliant people showed up in my life and I convinced them to be a part of this. And, uh, you know, one uh, in one day soon, we'll all be on a private jet to Necker Island to celebrate the success of it. So, yeah, it's a beautiful story. And our lead compound, I think yeah, I think I say in, in three simple steps, is named after my mother. She was Audrey Dowick. We're, we're a first and second name. And so it's called AD1. And uh, she'd be very nice. nice. Nice, nice. I love that. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's a, like in our company, we, you know, we've, we've managed to work out how to basically predict the real estate market, which is completely, everyone has said that that is not possible. And, and just like you, I am not the scientist. I'm like, I am not the, <laughs> but certainly that, um, that belief and that vision, I'm like, Surely we can solve this, you know. Surely we can do this. That is actually been the thing that drives it forward. I've got. I am not the scientist, right? but being being able to drive that intention and that vision uh, has has actually kind of what has been what has got us there. So I think as as I say, you know, three simple steps really was super impactful to me. A lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today, is stuff that I've actually been putting in my own life, and um, and again, it's but to tremendous effect. You know, I'm very grateful to to live a life that. You know, I wouldn't change a thing right now. It's it's perfect for exactly everything that I've set my intention for it to be. And a lot of that's got to do with the, the stuff that you've put out. I just want to um, kind of get my head around this because it's a little wild for me to consider. Across your companies, total the total value that you've created, the ones you've sold and all of that kind of stuff, the ones you've yet to sell, there must be over a billion dollars worth of company value that you've created. Is that a fair? 1.3 one, one, 1. at this moment. If. Wow. How does that make you feel? Do you have any attachment to that? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, there is a magic. We talked about before. There's a magic to thinking big, and and one of the things we have to do as entrepreneurs is is, is improve our relationship with money, because mm-hmm. when we start out, we don't have any, and and typically, and so we start to talk in thousands, and then when we get confidence, maybe tens of thousands, and and then hopefully things go parabolic, and before you know it, you're talking millions and gazillions, and and now it seems comfortable. One of the tricks is to start doing that really early on. Get you get improve your relationship with money, so that you can feel really comfortable talking in terms of hundreds of millions, billions, all the rest of it. It takes no more energy to create a billion dollar company as it does to create a $5 million company. It really doesn't. It's all up here. So I was going to go up with, so, so, so there is a magic to that, to that thinking big. 
in, in terms of improving our relationship with money, it's really important to understand that money is also energy. Energy converted, so, so it's, it's the energy of labor converted into a mechanism of exchange, converted again, all energy, into something else. And so when you understand that, you, you realize that money must flow. It's energy. Because if you just think of a river, it, you know, you can stand in a river and observe the flow, but if you build a dam because you want to keep it, you want it all for yourself, then you start to create back eddies and then the water stagnates and there's no use to anybody upstream or downstream. And so that's my analogy, my sort of metaphor for, for like making money flow. So, so, the, so the only excitement I have about this, obviously I don't get the whole billion dollars, right? The, the 500 million or whatever. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've got investors, you know, but I'm not, I'm not complaining. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy guy, but I will take that money and let it flow again. So, so when I started, you know, I had a few thousand, I let it flow, it became a few million, I let it flow, it became a few tens of million, I let it flow, and now it would probably be beyond maybe a hundred million, I'll let it flow by starting another company or creating something new. Mm. Um, and that's what all great entrepreneurs do. I mean, you know, the, the uh, Richard Branson's of the world don't stop and say, all right, I'm going to keep this now. You know, they're, they're continuously trying to innovate, continuously trying to create something new. And um, um, it changes your mentality a little bit from thinking that of money as something to hold, like a Hogwarts vault. You know, you put it in the vault and you sit on your gold coins. Money doesn't work like that, especially in business. So so if you take more the Richard Branson type of, of, of mentality where you keep it flowing, eventually your river that you're standing in expands like an estuary. And so you mm. can, whereas before you could just like put a little cup in and take a little sip of water because it was based a small little trickle of a stream. Now you can put your, you know, Put, put your yacht in it and suck out all the water in the yacht and you can use that. And that, so, so you get to your financial independence is not holding on to something and counting it. Your financial independence is being able to use it both for your lifestyle, because that's also a conversion of money energy into something else, but also for impactful businesses or uh, non-profits or like, like my animal sanctuary and stuff like that. Whatever turns you on, all my movies, whatever turns you on, you're able to keep the money flowing. And I'll never tire of that. I'm a little gray haired guy now and I just love it. It's so, it's, it keeps me useful, to be honest with you. I, you know, I've already got a few ideas for what to do next and uh, I'm really excited by it. Awesome. Trevor, I love that. I'm really grateful for the time that we've been able to spend together. I, we've covered uh, so much fantastic stuff and we'll definitely be uh, putting some links to your website and also to the course uh, in the show notes. Not for any, not because there's any kind of commercial agreement here, but because I genuinely want people to benefit from it. As I say, it's been, you've been very beneficial to me. And again, super grateful for the time we spent together. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. And all my proceeds from that course, by the way, go to the animal sanctuary. I don't, I don't take any money out of that. So. Yeah. 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 Love that. Love that. Trevor, I look forward to next time. Thanks. Very good. I appreciate it. Great questions. Thank you.